The views and opinions expressed on the following program are those of the host and guests and do not necessarily reflect the policy or position of Owen TV's management, staff, or board of directors. Hello and welcome in to Views from the Sidelines. I'm your host, Joey Tysick, my partner, Malik Hill. We're already into June. I can't believe it. June 1st and uh, NBA Finals. Or actually, is it June 2nd? I'm so smart. I don't know if it's June 1st. <laughs> Tomorrow's June 2nd. NBA Finals start tomorrow. Warriors versus the Celtics. This is the first time they've ever they've matched up since Wilt and Bill Russell, I think they said, crazy. which is the '60s. Weren't they the Philadelphia Warriors back then? Uh, I'm pretty sure. Probably. They they, probably yeah, they, they weren't they weren't Golden State yet. Yeah. Uh, so pretty crazy, a classic matchup if you were a grandparent now, but cool to see two teams that have kind of had bounce back seasons. Warriors kind of came back um, pretty strong this season now that Clay and everybody got healthy. And then the Celtics, they, I mean, we we ragged on them at one point during the season because they just, they couldn't get anything going. And now they're here in the finals. And I'm hoping it's, it's an exciting one. But we do have to go back real quick. I just want to talk about the Heat and Celtics game seven because... There was a little bit of controversy at the end. It was a very close game. And with it was 17 seconds left in the game, had, Jimmy Butler got the ball off a long rebound, dribbled down the floor, and the Heat are down by two. He pulls up for three with basically just Al Horford um, guard, would be guarding him. And he pulls up for the open three, kind of shoots it off balance. Misses it. Celtics go on to win the game by four. Do you think that was the right call by Jimmy Butler? Honestly, in the in retrospect, he could have gone to the rim. He could have he could have done several things when you look back at it. But in the moment, I don't blame him at all. He's the type of player that's gonna go for the win, especially if it's a game seven. And I think most other players in the league that are the best players on their team or the leading scorers would have taken the same shot. Mm -hmm. Now, the fact that he's not the greatest three-point shooter kind of adds to it. But I, I don't see any major fault in it, really. Yeah. Because... Even if he took it to the basket... I don't, I don't know. I don't I don't really have like a strong argument for either side. Yeah. I just think in that situation it's it's hard to right. Yeah. Know what you would have done in this situation. Yeah. And I don't fault him either. And you don't want to like get too lost, I guess, in seeing why you lost and all these things cuz it's a bigger factor than just the end of the game. But it's just kind of what I do. I'm very analytical at times. Looking back, there's there's an argument to be made that he may not have been able to beat Al Horford to the basket because Al, Al Horford is a underrated defender. But if anything, you think maybe they get to the line. But you also have confidence that Jimmy Butler is your best player. He can get by Al Horford and make a shot, tie the game up. I think my biggest thing isn't whether he went for the two or the three per se. But the problem was because he decided to go for the three, he had more time to take. I know you want to get there before any defender gets there, but he came up off balance. He's kind of fading. 
Now, a lot of coaches will rag on people, especially in high school and stuff, to not fade away, not do this, blah, 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 blah. We know it's a makeable shot for anybody. Um, as long as you get your shoulders square to the basket, you're fine. But I would just say he could have taken maybe one more dribble, gotten a little bit more under control because he's not known as a pr- prolific three-point shooter necessarily. Then you think if he went for the two, there was enough time left to force Boston to do something. The whole My whole issue, I think, with going for the three, there was still 17 seconds left. Even if he makes it, that might not have been the game-winning shot because then you're giving the ball to Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown for the Celtics, and they can go for the win, and they don't need to – they can get anything. Any shot will work. Heck, they could have gotten to the line and either tied it or won the game off some free throws. So I think that's my biggest, like, gripe with it is that even if he made that shot, it wouldn't have been a game winner necessarily. At the end of the day, it could have been because the Celtics could miss. But I think the problem with going for the three is there's still too much time left in the game. I think if you go for the two, then you force the Celtics to do something. Maybe you come up with a steal, a turnover, or something because there's so much time. Yes, you're giving the Celtics the opportunity to win the game, but I don't know. It, it's just it's just hard to say because they're they were in a tough spot no matter what. But the people that are saying like, oh, if he made that, they win the game. It's not necessarily true. So, I don't know. I have mixed feelings about it. Uh, at the end of the day, yeah, if if Jimmy Butler's taking that three for my team and I'm a guy that's, if I'm Kyle Lowry or something out there, I don't care. Like, that's Jimmy Butler. What am I going to tell him? That was a bad shot? No. Um, you believe that he has confidence. He's the one that basically got you there. So, you trust his shot. Um, and you live with it. And that's kind of how games go sometimes. Sometimes you make it, sometimes you don't. So, I don't know. I think it's just an interesting conversation. I feel like people get too lost in that one situation. Because whether he made it or missed it, there's still 17 seconds left in the game. It, like, realistically, the Heat still could have won. They could have fouled the Celtics. Celtics missed their free throws. Then they get another chance at it. You just you just never know what's gonna happen. So it's it's also he was honestly dominating mm-hmm. the entire. He didn't miss much of a step after that forty seven point masterpiece he put together. He ended with thirty five. He tried to take the three, and like you said, there was seventeen seconds left. But yeah, he he tried to get the lead mm-hmm. instead of tying it, and yeah, it just didn't go. Right, put them in control. It was a good way to finish out the series, though, after we said, like, the series was pretty boring for the most part. So for it to go seven and game seven to be pretty exciting, I think it made up for it. Yeah. A lot. And also Boston kind of almost, they almost gave it away mm-hmm. in the end because I understand that there are going to be double teams coming for Jason Tatum at the end of a game in situations like that. But I don't know why you can't figure out a way to get the ball back to back to him mm-hmm. once you get past half court. Right. There were too many instances where the ball ended up in Marcus Smart's hands with the shot clock going down, and he just had to throw up a shot and missed. Mm-hmm. And that pretty much got Miami back into the situation where they could win the game. Yeah. Golden State is just as smart on defense and maybe even smarter. I think they can't let that happen in the next game. Jason Tatum, I love how unselfish he's become, but it's, he's too unselfish sometimes. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't think that Bucks game where he had 46 on the road, to me, that shouldn't be an outlier. There should be more games where he gets all those shots and everybody should be clearing out and letting him make the decisions, whether he ends up taking the shot or not. But, yeah, I, in this finals matchup, they, they had to figure out a way to keep continue to get him into those best spots Mm -hmm. because the game where Jimmy had 47 game six, I think Jason Tatum only took four shots in the fourth quarter. Him and Jalen Brown only combined for like seven shots like that. That, that can't happen. Yeah. It just can't killer, the killer mentality. And he, he's shown he does have it sometimes, Mm -hmm. but 
like I said, he's become almost too unselfish sometimes. Yeah. Trying to share the ball. Especially when you're about to face guys like Steph and Clay that can literally take over a quarter. Not afraid at all. They're going to keep letting it go. Yeah. So let's get into that. Warriors, Celtics, NBA Finals. Kind of, a, I think it's a fun matchup. And just kind of like how I feel we always talk about, I think it's going to be that that third guy to step up. Because you look at the top players, Steph Curry, Jason Tatum, they're going to do their thing. They're going to have big nights. They're going to have off nights. Jalen Brown, Clay Thompson, they're both, they can both be like really streaky and go off for crazy amounts of points in short bursts. But who's going to be that third guy? For the Celtics, we've seen Marcus Smart step up plenty of times in this postseason. The Warriors, we've seen Jordan Poole do it. I don't know. I think it, like we're going to have to see, for the Warriors, they're going to need to see more of uh, Andrew Wiggins, like they saw a couple games in the Mavs series. Celtics, they're going to need Al Horford to give it his, his all. It's his first time being in an NBA Finals, and he was on some good teams in the past. Some of those uh, Hawks teams back in the day were supposed to make it to the NBA Finals. So somebody's got to step it up for one of the teams, and I think that's going to be probably the difference maker. For me, I still think it's going to be Jordan Poole. Um we saw him struggle a little bit in the Mavs series, but I think that he's going to be kind of the outlier because I think that I don't know exactly how the matchups are going to go, but Marcus Smart is definitely going to guard Steph. I'm not sure who they'll put on Clay. I'm assuming Jalen Brown. That's what I would think too. Yeah. And then that leaves Jason Tatum probably guarding Andrew Wiggins. Which is fine, honestly. It Which is. is. Especially since Jason Tatum has leveled up to like all NBA yeah. level defender. But I just think that that works for Jordan Poole and that he can go off again. Um, that's just my thoughts. Um, just quickly thinking about it. And then for the Celtics, Clay is probably still going to guard Jalen Brown. Draymond probably guards Jason Tatum. So that could be a, a tough one. This is this is where I think Boston has some advantages because they're one through five. They're all really good to great defenders, all of them. They, if you bring in Derek White, he can defend. Peyton Pritchard can defend some. You have a few weak spots with the Warriors, with Jordan Poole. Klay Thompson has gotten slightly better as the playoffs have gone on, but he's not the level of defender he was before his injuries. And Steph has honestly been surprisingly decent on defense, but he's still nowhere to the level of the defenders on Boston. Mm -hmm. So the Warriors will have to be on on offense yeah. because Boston is going to keep attacking all of their weak links. Yeah. Yeah. And I think you have to figure out, do you continue to start Kevon Looney at the five? I feel like because they, I feel like Al Horford or Robert Williams, I think they both have the advantage. And that's in that why situation. I think I, that's why I think they still have to though, because if you try to play small ball with those guys, I mean, I guess maybe they could. Draymond could guard. If one you of just those. try to run up and down, where you have Draymond at the five, and anybody on the court can get a rebound and go full speed. Yeah, I think that could be an advantage, but you can only do that for so long. Yeah, you can't do that for a full game. Yeah, maybe they do go back to that. I guess I didn't think about that. I would have figured yeah. they would have had to match big for big, but yeah, Draymond could probably guard Al or Robert Williams. Obviously, you're going to lose out on a little bit of size and stuff. Yeah, but you'll you'll lose some rebounds, but to me, as long as you don't give up a ton of offensive rebounds, mm -hmm. you should be fine. Yeah, and then that might be frees up somebody on the offensive side. Yeah, that'll be really interesting now that I think about it, of yeah. what – the Warriors want to implement. Yeah, go, they'll have to be very disciplined boxing out, and but they've they've done this before. They they've in, implemented the death lineup yeah. years ago that people started to put their own death lineups together of smaller fives and five players that can all handle and pass and shoot. Yeah, and we've seen a lot more of Jonathan Kuminga from the Warriors as yeah. things have gone and on. Moses Moody. Yeah, and it's been, incredibly surprising how well they look. Yeah, they've been playing well. So, 
I still give the slight edge to the Warriors, I think. I just think they're a deeper team, and I keep thinking this, every team they face. Um, but like you said, I do think the Celtics are more disciplined defensively. They have more than just, like, the Mavs just had Luka to take over a game. I think the Celtics have more guys that can actually just take over a game. Um, so, yeah. As usual, I hope it's a good series. In my heart, I want the Warriors to win because I don't, even though this is a different Celtics team, it's still that Celtics logo. I'm not a big fan, so I don't want to see them win. But I wouldn't hate it either because it is a team that, it's not the Celtics that I disliked necessarily. And the other cool thing, and I've seen people point out, is like both these teams are teams that are built from the bottom up. Like the Celtics drafted Jason Tatum. They drafted Jalen Brown. Yeah, they made some small moves to get like Al Horford and Derek White and things like that. But for the most part, it's all grown from the yeah. Celtics organization. And Danny Ainge leaves. You move Brad Stevens up to GM. Mm-hmm. And you fire Ime Udoka, who was brand new. Mm-hmm. And in the first season of all this new stuff, you make the finals. Yeah. And the Warriors are back to the finals, you know, after all the KD stuff and things like that. Yeah. I I wrote them off. <laughs> Mm-hmm. A few years ago, if you remember, I I kind of completely said it was all over. Yeah, and, and yeah, I'll I'll have to chalk that one up as a major L. And then all the sudden, take. I mean, and and to think they got James Wiseman a couple years back. I was just about to say they've done it all without him, and he hasn't had to do anything. But they they have been getting amazing draft picks. Jordan Poole, even Gary Payton the second's not too bad, and he might be back in the series. Which yeah, yeah. but then like he we said. Be. Jonathan Kuminga, Moses Moody, like all these yeah. really good draft I thought picks. them using those picks was a waste. Mm-hmm. And <laughs> In their short amount of time to kind of get back into it, you know, barring the injuries that we've seen from Clay and, and a couple Draymond, Nixon bumps, and even Steph. So, like, they've all been injured, and now they're healthy. They got the draft picks that they got to stock up on while they were down, and now they're already back. So, kind of crazy. Yeah, it's they won 15 games two years ago, yeah. and Eric Pascal was their best player. Mm-hmm. I it's it's really wild, the the ups and downs, th- that of a dynasty. Mm-hmm. I don't I don't know if I've seen a franchise with this many championships have such a dip like that, and then rise back up within like a year or two. Yeah, because even like we think of the Spurs as that steady team. Yeah, there was there was no downs. And the, they were at least 50 wins the every The Spurs season. are always like in the Tim Duncan era, like top of the Western Conference. Kawhi they dipped maybe a little bit. And then they've slowly been dipping down, but they haven't really gone past that 8th seed. Like they've always been there, but they never fell off like the Warriors did kind of for that short time. So, kind of curious to see how they're going to look being back in the finals. Um what would you say your predictions on this series are? I will go Warriors in seven. Okay. Because it's in Golden State. Is that your head or your heart? Head. Okay. Well, it's it's kind of your heart say different. It's kind of a mix of both. I I want Steph to get his fourth, mm-hmm. and for his legacy to keep growing. But I'd also like if Jason Tatum, at twenty four, already got his first ring and started building his great legacy. So. It's not like I'm like a fan, a fan of one team over the other. Right. I just want to see great basketball games like you. Mm-hmm. But I kind of would like to see Steph get his fourth, even more, and seeing Clay come back like this and get another ring and. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I'm kind of in the same boat. I'm more on the lines of it's going to be Warriors in five or six. I don't know why exactly why that is. Uh, I could definitely see it going seven. I just have some weird feeling that the Warriors are just going to put some killer instinct on being back in the finals and just kind of run away with it. I think the game should be still close. I don't think they're necessarily going to be blowouts, but I think the Warriors are going to win a couple close ones, and that kind of sucked the life out of the Celtics. Just my opinion, just my thoughts. But I do. I would hope that it goes seven. That would be my That'd be my heart. I would like to see it go seven. I also would like to see the Warriors win. 
Like I've said it many, many times before, I know a lot of people are tired of the Warriors. I get it. I understand it. But for me, I just can't get tired of this team just because of the way that they play. Um, they play really good defense. They move the ball on offense. They shoot a lot of threes. They're exciting to watch. And, yeah, they're not isolation basketball necessarily. So yeah. I, I feel the exact same. Outside of the Pistons of our, of our childhood, the Warriors of the past decade has been my favorite team to watch. That year they won 72 games. I watched every game they played on TV. Mm -hmm. ESPN or TNT or NBA. T I watched every single one. And I was in awe yeah. of how they played the game of basketball and how easy they made it look as a mm -hmm. team. And... Yeah, they're they're gonna go down as one of the all time great teams if they yeah. if they I, win this fourth. And I still think that Steph is just like the most enjoyable player to watch. At least for me. I know yeah. that a lot of people like LeBron and stuff like that. And I loved watching Vince Carter, Kobe Bryant, Dirk Nowitzki growing up. Those guys all had their own flair. There's something different about Steph. I, I don't know what it is necessarily. I know it's partially the threes, the distance, but just kind of the, the way that he feels like he has fun while he's doing it. Like, you think back to Kobe, super serious all the time. Just wanted to be a killer at all times. Steph has that, but he's – it's more of a joking matter. Yeah, this, is, this is the reason why they call him the babyface assassin. Yeah. Because it's all smiles. It's all, yeah. You might get intense every now and then, but right. he's celebrating when he's hitting big shots. He's, yeah, it's it's all about having fun mm -hmm. with him. Yeah. And I also, I, I'm starting to really think over time that this is just more of a me thing. I haven't met many people that share this, like, way of thinking with basketball. I get so much more joy out of seeing the guys that don't, that weren't blessed with all the God level athleticism, all the guys that don't have verticals over 40. Yeah. And he's 6'3, 180 pounds. Mm -hmm. Went to Davis. Had, had insane ankle injuries for his first four years. Looked like he might never recover. Right. And within a blink of an eye, he changed the game of basketball and has become the greatest shooter of all time. Mm -hmm. And he's also one of the most underrated finishers of all time. And has gotten stronger as time has gone on. I I root for those. There's a reason why Jimmy Butler is my favorite player. Yeah. In a lot of ways, he shouldn't be doing the things he's doing. And I love that even more about him. Mm -hmm. The fact that he can take down the greats. Yeah. Yeah. I, I prefer those types of players. And I, I honestly think not many people feel that way. Yeah. A lot of people prefer the greats. Yeah. No, I, I'm that way too. I mean, if you just look at. Well, the more, the more, even more talented greats. Right. I mean, if you just look at the up and down and like some of my favorite players and the guys that I latch on to, it's, it's typically, typically for the most part, guys that nobody cares about, you know? Exactly. I like this, just kind of the random, the Kevin Herters of the world, you know, just, I don't know. It, it's just fun to see that. And especially when those guys pop off, cause you're in the NBA, everybody's capable of having a big game at some point. Um, it's just whether or not they do it or not. But I, I'm also curious to see where this puts Steph as far as the greatest players of all time. He'll be borderline top ten. Because a lot of people are saying if he gets his fourth, he's gonna he's gonna jump a lot. He he can never it's impossible to jump over. It's a few players that you can't jump. LeBron will all will be the greatest small forward of all time. Jordan will be the greatest small forward ever. Magic will be the greatest point guard. To me, those are impossible to get over. Mm. Steph will be cemented as the second greatest point guard ever. I don't know if he can get into the top 10. He might be around 9 or 10, depending on how these finals go. He has to be great in these finals also. He can't average like 24 on horrible shooting percentages, and they just win. Right. He, he has to be great. Yeah. And and get another ring to get to in think, that top ten. You have to think he hasn't won an NBA Finals MVP yet. Exactly. So he, he has to be great. That is some people's mark against him, but I mean, they gave it to Andre Iguodala. They gave it to Kevin Durant. Like, come on, I don't know. Um. So yeah, it, it's interesting. And then again, like you said on the Celtics side, if the Celtics win, that could be a big, 
that could be a big swing for the Eastern Conference just in general. Um, oh, the other thing I wanted to talk about, what do you think about these conference finals MVPs? The Magic Johnson Western Conference Finals MVP, the Larry Bird Eastern Conference Finals it's MVP. It's going to become more normal in five to ten years, but all of us older basketball fans, that, that sounds crazy saying that, that. We are going to be the older basketball fans. Yeah, we're heading there. All the kids and teenagers are going to somewhat care about Conference Finals MVPs, and I, if they start adding those onto resumes, uh, come yeah. on. Come on now. I'll say it right out. I mean, it's it's cool that Magic Johnson and Larry Bird have their, like, it's it's cool that they get their flowers, but yeah, we but we they really, we appreciate them enough already. But do they really care either? Like, oh great, they added an award for just to put our names on it. We're not even the finals MVP. You know, Larry doesn't matter. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't care. Yeah, <laughs> I I hate it to be honest. It's just it's not necessary. What are we gonna we're gonna do a first round? <laughs> MVP, like, come on. I don't know. A play-in tournament MVP? Well, that might actually happen. I just... I mean, there. listen, there have been ideas of a middle-of-the-season tournament. That... Oh, sure. And they would probably name it MVP of the mid-season tournament. That would be okay, I guess. But, like, I don't know. It just... What's it the is point? strange. What's the point? What's going to... What's going to happen the when the Western Conference MVP is the one that loses? That's going to be d- disappointing. I mean, how many times does that actually happen, though? It doesn't happen like, too often. LeBron long. won Finals MVP when they lost. Yeah. Did wait? Did he? Did he? No, people thought he should have. That was that was when Iguodala won. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I forgot about that. But I don't know. It just seems meh. Anyway, NBA Finals starting tomorrow. Pretty excited. I'm going to watch every single game. I want to make sure to watch it closely, and I'm hopefully going to have a lot of fun watching it. Some other news and notes that we got. There are some basketball things going on. Darvin Ham was hired as the Los Angeles Lakers head coach. Good luck, buddy. Uh, former Listen, Fans are excited. Former Bucks assistant, former Piston back in the day. Got a championship with the team. Man, a crazy bounce. Duncan Darvin Ham for a reason. Um, he was a fun role player to see on the Pistons back in the day. It's crazy to think now he's head coach of the Lakers. Um, it just thinks that it's the Lakers. And it's LeBron's Lakers. And, yeah. That's a rough. I always say, like, as a first-time head coach. It's not a, it's not a fun game. This is not ideal. It's fun that you get to watch LeBron. Yeah. Every game. Because just, and sometimes Russell Westbrook will flash back to his old self. Just think of Jason Kidd. We thought that when Jason Kidd first got hired, it's like, oh, maybe this guy isn't cut out to be a head coach. It just took time. I, took time. He's doing good now. Yeah. But you never know when it's going to be like, oh, mm, Darvin Ham, he didn't do very good in his first year with the Lakers. I don't know. Maybe he's not suited for this. So that's I, that's the only part where it gets me nervous a little bit, I guess. But it's a big job to take. We'll see how he does. I kind of wish him the best. Kind of don't. It's a it's a <laughs> weird one to have to deal with. If they got rid of LeBron, sure, okay, fine. But it's the Lakers at the end of the day. There there are some Lakers fans that believe they should just blow it up. I think they should. And honestly, why not? Yeah. They're already trying to move on from Russell Westbrook, so. I've I've seen they're most likely keeping him. Okay. Well, I, so good luck even more. I think at this point they have to. But anyway. Russ, just go, just come off the bench, man. Just be the sixth man. Why not? Russ, Russell Westbrook and Carmelo Anthony off the bench. What a world. <laughs> they they got to reshuffle that roster. It's yeah. too many corpses on that roster. Um, Another little coaching thing. Quinn Snyder may be leaving the Jazz. He and, might do the same thing Sloan did when – uh, Darren Williams almost pretty much made him quit. Yeah. I think Donovan Mitchell or Rudy Gobert might just make this man quit. Yeah. Quinn Snyder came in eight eight years ago now. That doesn't even seem right. It doesn't. That makes me feel old. And he looked very young when he first got the job. He yeah. looks like a like a he looks like a mob boss that <laughs> that just got arrested. Yeah. And it's all over now. 
and that's kind of what he looks like. And he was the big reason, like the Jazz have turned around their franchise fairly quickly. Um, people forget in the middle two thousands, this Jazz team was also very good with Darren Williams, Mehmet Okur, Carlos Boozer, Andre Karolinko. Man, what what a team! Um, anyway, and they fell off for a while. Slowly been building back. Those Jazz teams in the middle were really. Just ugh, yeah. You trade for old Devin Harris. Mm-hmm. You got just a bunch of Demari Carroll before yeah. anybody knew who he was. It was just a weird assortment of players. Yeah, especially once uh, once Darren Williams moved on. Young Enos Cantor. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good times. <laughs> Were they? <laughs> <laughs> Were they? <laughs> uh, Ronnie Brewer. Listen, they they had Gordon. They had young Gordon. That was the hope. Yeah, and that worked out for a little Trey bit. Burke, Really didn't. No. And then they've slowly been kind of working their way back. And Quinn Snyder came in, and they've been towards the top of the West for a while now. Yeah. Um. So it'll be interesting to see if he stays or if he leaves. I also am kind of on board with I think he more likely leaves than stays, depending on what their roster looks like in the offseason. I would also be curious to see where he goes because he would be a highly coveted coach, I would assume. Um. For a lot of teams. I know he was rumored for the Lakers for a while. Um, but the Lakers are too impatient. They got to get get moving on things. So, he went with Darvin Ham. Interesting. Um, another thing. The Pelicans are saying that they are not going to fully guarantee Zion's contract extension. They've been trying to get um, a contract extension in the works for Zion. They would give him the max offer, but they are wanting to not fully guarantee it, I would assume, because of the injuries and all that stuff that happened the past year. Zion also saying that he would accept a contract extension to stay with the Pelicans. I don't know if that's a PR thing or he's actually serious about it. Just makes this whole Pelicans-Zion scenario so much weirder, I guess. I would love if he stayed with the Pelicans. Being a Pelicans fan myself, seeing them play the way they played in the playoffs, would he mess up their chemistry? Possibly. But at the same time, if he fit in there, which I would hope that C.J. McCollum could kind of work with him and figure it out, they could be a nightmare. He has to defend and rebound. That's the one thing. Scoring, everybody knows they can't stop him. When he's he's healthy and... Still has his quickness, quickness and strength and bounce. I don't think there's anybody on the planet that can stop him from getting at least 23, 25. Mm-hmm. The rebound numbers have to go up, and he has to at least he has to try on defense. Yeah. At least give consistent effort. Mm-hmm. And under Willie Green, I think he will give some. Yeah, some more. <clears throat> I'm hoping that he bought into their playoff run. That like he if, saw, he, if he didn't, uh, I'd be disappointed. Yeah. Because they're so young. Mm-hmm. Even Jonas Valanciunas still isn't 30 yet. Right. I think he's like 27, 28. Mm-hmm. CJ's over 30, isn't he? Or uh, did he just turn 30? Yeah, he's still he might somewhat be just young. 30. But yeah, he's he's like the main veteran, and he's not that old yet. Right. So yeah, they they got a lot of hope. Yeah, and I, I think that would be... At this point, I mean, they just made the playoffs with a team that we didn't think would make the playoffs. And they gave the Phoenix a little bit of a scare. And then a team, you know, that he was looking, like people were saying, oh, Zion's going to go to New York. New York just missed the playoffs. They're right back at square one almost. And I don't know if Zion's going to solve their problems either. So I think at this point he's he's just better off to just stay put where he is. He just has to figure it out mentally, physically. He's just got to figure out what he wants to do. Um. He has, to, he has to mature. Because otherwise, we're running into another. Don't say it. Don't ben say Simmons it. Simmons situation. It's, 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 it will take a lot for it to get to that. It will take it a would, whole lot. But it's on that trajectory. Listen, Ben Simmons, it, to this day, he's still the only person I've seen completely melt down mentally like that in the playoffs with that level of talent. Yeah. We'll see if he he's comes back. He's the only one. We'll see if he comes back next year. There's a lot of. Let's save Ben Simmons' talk for next season. We don't, we don't even have to talk about him. Unless something happens over the summer, I, I guess. I also have to address James Harden. 
Man, there, there's some stuff to talk about. Poor Joel Embiid. <laughs> but, <laughs> Poor Joel Embiid. Yeah, before we do that, we'll get back to like our typical summer fun episodes of top tens and things like that. Um, I've been trying to think of some recently. Um, college basketball. We got a couple other transfers, some very notable ones. Um, we'll start with the other one, the Big Ten. Um, one of my favorite players actually in college basketball in the last couple of years. The man with the mullet. Yeah, the mullet man, Matthew Mayer, going to Illinois. Uh, Most people thought he was going to North Carolina, and the Tar Heel fans were salty Yeah, about it. Which, yeah. I mean, makes sense. It, they just came off a national championship. Yeah. They thought they were getting Brady Manning 2.0. Yeah. Um, Meyer coming off a gr- couple great seasons for Baylor. He's their six-man six, guy, six man kind of deal, but he can score in bunches. He could definitely be a starter on teams. Yeah. This is this is going to be the first time he's going to be in that star role. Yeah. Him and Terrence Shannon, they got from Texas Tech. They're going to be relied on to be the guys. Yeah. And Illinois, I mean, they're in a spot to do something in the Big Ten. Uh, they have great guard play. They're losing Kofi Coburn. So, I mean, I guess he could technically still come back, but um, it doesn't look like it as far as I can tell. Uh, so they're going to be a team to watch. I think he's going to add another depth for the Illinois team, something they've kind of been missing. Um, and yeah, do do you think this puts Illinois in the middle of the Big Ten towards the top? Uh, no, I think it definitely secures them top four at least. Okay. You add Mayer and Shannon. You're bringing back R.J. Melendez, who came on strong near the end of the season. Um, I forgot the name of the, the the redhead shooter that was shooting really well in the tournament, too. He was a freshman. Oh, yeah. He's coming back. You got one of your bigs coming back, and you're bringing in a transfer from Baylor. You got some pieces. And Sky Clark, who was the five-star freshman coming in that people thought was going to Kentucky. He ends up going with Illinois. You have some serious pieces. You just got to make them fit because most of them are new and yeah, they, they don't know how they're going to play together. Right. So you have a bunch of talent and if it comes together, even if it takes like the first two, three weeks of the season, they should be a a force in the big 10. If it all comes together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can, I can definitely see that. Luke Goody. That was the name of the shooter. Yes. Yeah. Cause they're losing. Kofi Coburn, Alonzo Plummer, yep. Trent Frazier. So they're losing a good amount of guys. Yeah. Um, they they really needed to hit on Mayer and Shannon. They needed to. Is Curbelo staying with Illinois or he, did he transfer? He transferred to St. John's back home. That's what home. I thought, yeah. yeah. Back home in New York. Yeah, I I was pretty sure he Yeah, so transferred. Sky Clark might be starting as a freshman at point guard. So it'll be a lot on his shoulders. Is there small forward still staying? Which one? The, like the defender. Uh, Grandison? No. He had like blonde hair. Or blondish hair. Uh, blondish hair? I'll get back to it. Let me look. Um, Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins. He's, he's going to be the big. Okay. Uh, he's going to be a, the starter at the five most likely. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, uh, getting him back was really nice because he can stretch the floor. He's really athletic. He needs yeah. to put on more, for, more muscle if he's going to play the five because – yeah. In that conference, you're going to be in the gauntlet almost every week, especially Trace Jackson Davis is coming back to Indiana. Hunter Dickinson is back. Yeah. Yeah, you you got to be strong. Zach Eady is back at Purdue. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that, that might be a bit of a mis- – I mean, yeah, misadvantage because all the other bigs are so big yeah. and so good, but they, they got the talent at every other position. Right. Um – while we're on the topic, I mean, we don't have all transfer stuff done, but for the most part, what do you think the Big Ten is going to look like for college basketball? Like, who do you think is you, – because you said the top four. Who do you think that top four is going to be? The hype on Indiana is going to be serious. With Trace Jackson Davis coming back, with their five-star freshman they had last year, Tamar Bates coming back, they have another crop – of I think three five star kids coming in this year, plus some veterans returning. 
I think the hype will be a bit too much. But since they have a National Player of the Year candidate in Trace Jackson, so mm-hmm. they're going to get a lot of hype. Uh, like I said, Illinois, it might take a minute for them to figure things out, but once they get going, it should be good. I think Michigan getting Jalen Llewellyn was big. Hunter Dickinson coming back. Not having uh, Diabate is going to be tough. Mm-hmm. But I like the freshman class they have coming in this year even more than the last one that was hyped up last year. It might take a little time because they have some new pieces, but I trust the experience they have, even though it's kind of young. Yeah. I don't know about Michigan State. They return they return a lot, but they also – Max Christie staying in the draft hurts. Mm-hmm. Julius Marble was your most consistent big. He's gone. You got Hoggard. You got Hauser. I mean, having um, Jay Nakins back, they're going to depend on – I think they're going to depend on him to have a big leap this year mm-hmm. because they need that go-to score. Jackson Kohler has been one of my favorite high school players for a long time. He's been, he's been unstoppable in the post since it, like he was a freshman in high school. He should be an instant bucket. I think they should start Jackson Kohler, either at the four or five. Like, if it's Sissoko at the five for defense and Kohler at the four, mm-hmm. maybe they do that with Hauser at the three, but I don't know. But Malik Hill, Malik Hall is back, too. Maybe they still bring him off the bench. Right. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure with MSU. But, mm-hmm. yeah, there's 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 a – I'm going to have to do even more research on the big team because I know the recruiting class is coming in, and I know some of the experience. Purdue loses a lot. Yeah. And they haven't replaced much of it. Right. So I, I don't know if they can still figure things out in the transfer portal. Same with Iowa. Yeah. Iowa's going to lose a lot. Yeah, Iowa has Keegan Murray's brother, Chris Murray, back. Yeah. But who knows if Chris is going to have a Keegan Murray-type season. Right. They lost their point guard, Joe Toussaint, to West Virginia. Mm-hmm. They have some good pieces returning, but... Jordan Bohannon wasn't allowed back for his eighth exactly. year. I, I don't know if they have the firepower to replicate the offenses they had. Right. I just don't know if they do. So, yeah, Michigan, Indiana, Illinois. That fourth spot is going to be – there's there going to be a few teams fighting for that fourth spot. Yeah. But those are the three that are in my head right now. Mm-hmm. Michigan State will probably be between, like, four and six. Yeah. Most likely just because they're going to be well coached and they're going to play hard. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't know what teams will, like, make a big jump or – I'm not sure. I have to – yeah, I'll have to look into the rest. Yeah. Um – all right, the other big transfer we got to talk about. Malik gave up his Oakland Golden Grizzlies last season after they made – they missed – I didn't give up on the kids. <laughs> they missed the tournament. Uh, so – You know who I gave up kinda on. Kind of gave up on the program a little bit. How, I halfway gave up on the program. I, I gave up on a specific man in particular. But he's back. Rocket Watts transferring – once again. And this time, he's coming home. Going to Oakland. Yeah. Going to be a Golden Grizzly. Malik, take the floor. Listen. This is his last... Well, I think he gets an extra year because of the told transfer portal and the COVID year and stuff. Mm-hmm. But this, this is really his last year to really show all the talent and promise he had coming into college. When he went to MSU... I didn't think it was a good fit. He had a good, really good second half of his freshman year. They ended up winning the Big Ten regular season. Going into the conference tournament, I think everybody was excited about what he was doing because he was their most explosive scorer for the most part in the second half of the season. He was just getting better. Tournament gets canceled. Coming into the second season, the hype goes up. He really only has one really good game against Duke and – the team wasn't good, and none of it just ever came together. Mm-hmm. Since then, he's dealt with injury, goes to Mississippi State. He's in and out of the lineup because of injury and never being able to get into a rhythm because of it. So he comes home. If he's fully healthy, all the talent should show. To this day, he's still the most gifted young scorer I've seen in a high school setting. He led the EYBL in scoring. 
against the top players in the country. It's still in there. He just has to get his mind right and his body right. And Oakland should be dangerous because they also got Lauren Bowman from Wisconsin, who was also from Michigan to transfer back home. He's coming to Oakland. So they're going to have a three-guard lineup. Mm -hmm. Rocket Watts, Lauren Bowman, and Jalen. Jalen Moore. Yeah. Going to be a lot of up-tempo, a lot of high-scoring games. I'll be at several Oakland games this year. (laughs) Still not a fan of Campy. But I, it's still my school. I'm still supporting the kids. There you go. The young men. So we'll see, man. We shall see. Yeah. I, it. The hard part, though, for me, Horizon League's getting tough. It's tough. We've seen Cleveland State, Northern Kentucky, Wright State. They're there almost every year. They're they're consistent. They they just maintain that consistency. Yeah. So. Cleveland State, they lost Dennis Gates to Missouri, so I don't know how they're going to look this year. Hmm. And Wright State, they're, a few of their best players transferred to higher major schools, one of them to Ohio State and one of them to, I think, Virginia Tech. Yeah, they lost a few of their best players. So, yeah, it's it could be up in the air this year. Hmm. It really could. Yeah. Oh, I know what we can talk about. Since we're getting into the NBA and the NBA finals are around the corner, we're starting to slow down on topics. And so we're picking up stuff. And like I said, once the NBA finals are over, we'll get back to like those old fun episodes of just top tens and things like that. We'll see if we can get people to come on the show and do that. But the one thing that I forgot that came out, the NFL schedule. The Lions schedule is out. I want to go through it. Week one, the Lions are playing the Eagles. It's a fun game. Yeah, that, that'll, that'll be a pretty – is it in Philly? Um, I don't think I've ever seen the Lions win at Philadelphia. I'm going to nope, be honest. No, it's at Ford Field. Okay. And that will be A.J. Green, A.J. Brown's first game. Uh, then we play the Commanders. Should be a Win. Win. <laughs> Then we play the Vikings. Then we play the Seahawks. They, we, listen, if they beat the Vikings, if they're three and one, <laughs> the hype is going to be stupid, ridiculous. Yeah, I kind of hope they don't start three and one. <laughs> Same. Uh, week four, they play the Seahawks. Should be a win. Uh, week five, they play the Patriots. Should it's be probably a good, probably should be a good game. Yeah, is it in Foxborough? Um, you you haven't said yes. which games besides the first one. You didn't say which ones are at home or away. I need to figure out which is which. Okay, Lions play at home week one. Lions play at home week two. Okay, they're in Minnesota week three. That'll be tough. Home against the Seahawks or yeah against the Seahawks. That better be a win. Then they're away. That's that's probably a loss against the Patriots. Another away game against the Cowboys. Boy, I hope they win that one. That would be beautiful if they beat the Cowboys. Home against the Dolphins. Home against the Packers, so they got a lot of front front loaded home games. Hmm. Uh, then they go away to the Bears, should be a win. Go away to I the, I don't know. What if Justin Fields makes that? And who's leap? he throwing to? Darnell Mooney. <laughs> cool. You have a point. <laughs> um, you have a point. <laughs> then they're away again to the Giants, should be a win. Um, unless Saquon Barkley. You don't believe Barkley in Danny Dimes back. anymore? Well, I don't know. Um, home against the Bills. That'll be a massacre. Yes. Then they're home against the Jaguars. Home against the Vikings. Watch, tre- watch Trevor Lawrence have his career game. Watch. Home against the Vikings. They're they're going to lose. They're probably going to split the Vikings. They're going to split. Then they're going to the Jets. Going to the Panthers. Home to the Bears. Away to the Packers. They could be a six-win they- team. They have a fairly easy schedule. They could be a six-win team. So, let's see. Eagles, too much of a toss-up. Commanders, should be a win. Vikings, probably too much of a toss-up. I won't. Yeah, 
That's a 50-50 because it's in Minnesota. Seahawks they, should be a win. They better win that game. Patriots, probably a loss. Yeah. Cowboys, probably a loss. Dolphins, I'm unclear. Packers. It, yeah, we, we got to see how to, how Tua looks those first few Packers, weeks. a loss. The Bears should be a win. Is that Packers game in? in uh, That's at home. They could beat the Packers at home. I've I've seen them beat the Packers at home when they shouldn't several times. I'm just times. going for more certainty, though. Okay. Bears should be a win. Giants should be a win. Wait a minute. Are we playing the Bills on Thanksgiving? Oh, gosh. <laughs> Wait, we don't have any nationally oh. televised games, though. How does that work? I thought Thanksgiving was nationally televised. It is. But it, oh, it's not a prime time. That's okay. that's why I was thinking they didn't get a prime time game. That's what it is. Um, so for the Jaguars, would you consider that a should win? Right, I would think so. Here's the thing: <laughs> they just signed Christian Kirk to eighty million dollars. Here's the thing: and Zay Jones got too much. Everybody got too much money. But what if Trevor Lawrence starts making that leap? And he comes in here and he just starts carving them up. Because their secondary still probably won't be they, – they have some good young players. I don't expect them to be one of the better sec, like best secondaries in the league. Yeah, I think they'll be in the middle of the pack. And I don't know. I think that could be a talk. They're going to lose some games they should win also because of the right. Lions. Right. That and could be one of them. And they're going to beat the Bills on Thanksgiving. So Listen. <laughs> they've done I, weird stuff. I don't before. know if I'm going to go with that one. but um. Okay, Vikings, probably a loss. The, um, the Jets, I would think that should be a win. Panthers, they're a weird one too, but that should be a win. Yeah. Bears, this one's at home. Do they beat the Bears twice? I was like, which which NFC North team do they sweep yeah. most likely? I don't know. It, it probably should be the Bears. Yeah. But I, I've seen the Bears – Beat them at odd times, too. Yeah. And then they lose to the Packers. So, yeah, that's right around six should wins, at least. Yeah. Which I don't like. I don't like it. I want them to, like I said, I want them to lose one more year. Um, But we'll see. I Listen, watch, watch them go 5-12. and 12. Yeah. Watch them go 5-12. and 12. That would be good improvement. I just And just enough to stay in the top ten, maybe. Yeah. Probably, yes. I just hope not. Hope not. The NFL season is going to kick off September 8th. Bills and Rams open the season. That should be fun. But, yeah. And then, like we said, hopefully the Lions will get into HBO Max. We can watch Hard Knocks. Um... I never watched the Indianapolis Colts like regular season hard knocks. No, I didn't. And they picked a team for this year's, and I forgot who it is. Yeah, already. I don't know. <laughs> I'm not yeah. concerned. I just want to see the Lions, see what they look like. Um, and then we'll get, like we said, we got NBA Finals going on. Those will start tomorrow. Then we're gonna get into the NBA draft. We'll start doing more of the prospects and things like that. And then, like we said, we'll probably take a little hiatus from just actual news or we'll just do little tidbits here and there of each thing we'll just have some fun episodes maybe we'll start if if the warriors win we might have to debate where steph curry lands and the yeah. top players greatest of all time where the warriors land as greatest teams of all time because i've been seeing a lot of greatest teams debates there, there's a there's a slams slam magazine's greatest teams list mm. is coming down to almost the top five i the, think they just released the ninth They've gone yeah. from 75 all the way down to 9. And they hit. They put the Pistons in 2004 like 40-something. It was pretty disappointing. Um, I think it should be Honestly, higher. the 2005 team was better. But the 2004 team got it done. Yeah. Um, and then I don't know if you saw that Kendrick Perkins said that his fi- favorite finals of all time to watch the 04 was fun. the 04 yeah. finals with the Pistons and the Lakers. He's, he said some cool things lately about the. He said he trusted Troy Weaver. When yeah. somebody asked him about the Pistons, he said the 04 Finals was his favorite. Mm-hmm. Perk has some decent things to say, like, every six months. <laughs> yeah. I still don't like him, but, you know, it's all right. 
Um, the other cool thing too, actually, now just thinking of ESPN, CJ McCollum is going to be on uh, ESPN as an analyst um, during this. I think he's is he going to be on for the finals or is it more off season stuff? Do you know? Honestly, I'm not even sure. Okay. It would be nice to see him during the final. I want to see him and JJ. Yeah, together. that's what, that's what a lot of people are excited yeah. about to see CJ and JJ. Um, also, can we get Stan Van Gundy off the broadcast, please? I didn't really pay attention to the broadcast. It was, I was watching it with like a bunch of family, so I wasn't like tuned into what was being said. I didn't even know Mike Breen was out. Yeah, I'm just. I didn't even realize it. I just. I'm not a fan. I'm of, happy I didn't hear it. I'm just not a fan of Stan's play-by-play or anything or his announcing. I, it's a personal thing. I, I he does a good job Listen, technically. Most people have said, yeah. I just I don't like his. You got to get somebody with enthusiasm to yeah replace. Obviously, it. he knows a lot, but I don't know. He's just not that enjoyable to me. I like Reggie Miller a lot. Um, you are in the minority on I, that one. I've I've realized that, but and <laughs> people I, really don't like Reggie. And he was also one that I never thought that I would like either. But I've come to like Reggie. Um, I don't know. I just think there's more guys out there that they can get. So we'll see. Um, but yeah, there's been views from the sidelines. We will see you guys next time. If you have not seen the 30 for 30, the greatest mixtape ever that just dropped about the N1 mixtape tour in the late 90s and early 2000s, please watch it. Very entertaining time in basketball. Great story.